Welcome to Electrified. It's your host, Dylan Loomis. Quick shout out to my newest patrons, Dan S and Derek B. Thank you guys for choosing to support the channel. First up today, we get some preliminary data from the CPCA about Tesla's June delivery figures of 78,000, which would be a new record by a pretty significant margin. And for some context, this would be up 142% from May, month over month, and this would be up 135% from one year ago. Now you're looking at Tesla Shanghai data you have to remember the factory didn't even open again after the shutdowns until April 19th and then it started exports on May 11th so to go from effectively zero in April in terms of deliveries to then 78,000 for the month of June is really really impressive a great sign for the future if there are future shutdowns which we'll talk about later in today's episode but if this 78,000 figure is confirmed as you can see the previous high watermark for deliveries not production was was 70,800 back December of 2021. So this would be a 10% increase. And it's always great to see what the true capability of this factory is. And those goal poles do continue moving in the right direction. And if you recall, there was an internal memo a few weeks ago that said Tesla wanted to produce 71,000 units for the month of June. So once again, if they pull that off, that would indeed be a new record high. We should have the official data soon enough. And Chris Zhang is saying if that 78,000 number is true, that means more than 6,000 units were delivered every day over the last four days of the month, which is one more thing that is really mind blowing when you stop and think about it. Now, I'm not going to read you the tweet. I just have to say, I definitely disagree with this one. Just because Tesla does not have a PR department doesn't mean that people like you and I can't be upset when the media doesn't do its job or it reports bad information or tries to spin things in a way that doesn't really portray reality. Look, Gary is very adamant about Tesla having a PR department, which is fine, but just because Tesla doesn't, doesn't mean that we shouldn't continue to call out the media when it does a poor job. In my opinion, what do you guys think? The user Monroe Live Stewart on Reddit has been commenting on some videos as of late sharing some good information on this new structural pack and the new Model Y. I believe this is an employee of Monroe based on the information that he or she is sharing. In this one they said, personally, I think that the battery will be heavier talking about just the battery not with the seats and the console and everything else than the 2020 version of the Model Y, so the previous version. But you have to remember that it's the load floor as well as the battery, so you're eliminating all of those load floor parts and their weight, even if you're adding some of that into the battery, eliminating those parts saves some money and some weight. So the takeaway, remember that this structural pack is also serving as the load floor. When asked about the pack having liquid cooling, they said, can confirm I drained the coolant, got about a gallon in the pan and about four ounces on myself, one connector in the front, one in the back, other coolant lines are routed along the sides of the pack like the RDU lines and the coolant return line for the battery. And one more, personally, I don't think that the seat center console and carpet are 100 kilograms. Remember, one kilogram is equivalent to 2.2 pounds. So the battery pack itself is probably heavier than the old design, which we just talked about. The big savings is eliminating the load floor, both in terms of weight, raw material cost, and labor cost. Just being able to stand inside the vehicle and install the pillar trim rather than to hang into the vehicle from the outside, bend backward and clip it in is a huge ergonomic advantage. Also, by the way, making things much safer on the line. Tesla is playing the big picture game, seeking gains across the entire vehicle rather than looking at single part savings. This right here is a huge differentiator that most people still do not understand. And commenting on the new structural pack, Elon said, the structural pack is the right overall architecture from a physics standpoint, but it's still far from optimized, which is exciting in and of itself. Many more iterations to come, I would imagine. Some of you are going to love this and others of you will be frustrated. Remember how we were talking about the green light chime and how it should be available to all cars with autopilot, not just FSD beta users? Well, that's happening, but there's a but. With a new software update, Tesla has expanded this feature to all cars with autopilot when traffic light and stop sign control is activated. So if you're stopped at a red light on your phone, there's an audible chime when the light turns green, or if you're waiting behind another car, the chime will play once the car ahead of you advances, unless tack or auto steer is active. Here's the but. 
It sounds like it would only work with vehicles with the Hardware 3.0 computer. The Hardware 3 computer was put into the Model S and X in March of 2019 and the Model 3 vehicles in April of 2019. So that's a rough ballpark, but there is a way you can check your vehicle. In the main menu, select software and then choose additional vehicle information and the car's hardware information should be listed for you there. Alex Voigt shared this chart on Twitter and it covers some of the information that we talked about yesterday in data form, but things are always better in chart form. So this is quarter two USA vehicles sales change by percent year over year. Of course, Tesla in the yellow doing very well year over year on a quarterly basis and most other automakers with the exception of Porsche and Ford are indeed in the negative and some fairly significantly. I found this on Reddit and I think a quick PSA is in order. If you see one of these pull through Tesla superchargers, remember to try to use the other ones if of course they're available. Now, if all of the regular stalls are used up, then feel free to use what is there. However, this is going to become increasingly important once the Cybertruck is out in the wild, towing things, which is really what these pull through stations are for. Now, I'm not going to play this clip for you because most of it was just Gene responding to Gordon Johnson and it's just a waste of your time. However, there was one line that's worth pointing out. Gene said he thinks Tesla can get to a point where they can go from 70 billion to $400 billion in revenue in the next five years. At first, it may seem wild. However, the math checks out. Going from 70 billion to 400 billion over five years, it's only a 41.7% Kager or compound annual growth rate. And in quarter one of this year, Tesla did around $18 billion in revenue. So if you annualize that first quarter, that would be around 75 billion. And presumably it should be comfortably higher than that by the time we get to the end of the year. This right here is a great reminder of why it's important to invest in growth companies for the long term, three years, five years, 10 years, 20 years, because of things like this. It is rare to find, but Tesla is on track to pull this off. Yesterday, we talked about that recall from Germany of Model 3 and Ys affecting around 60,000 vehicles. Well, they were saying that you would have to go to a Tesla service center basically to fix this e-call situation. If the car is in an accident, it would automatically call the emergency responders. Well, that wasn't working. Now Tesla is saying this is not necessary, meaning going to a service center. The update can take place at any time as long as the car is connected to the internet. So it sounds like OTA update, no surprise. A good tweet from not a Tesla app talking about what to expect with FSD 10.13, summarizing some of the data that Elon has shared, we should see better unprotected left turns, going deep on roundabouts, navigating without maps, and beginning of navigating without GPS. A question many of us have been wondering, how long until Tesla uses FSD in the boring tunnels? Elon said maybe later this year. Now, as always, Unfortunately, this is still something to watch. It looks like Shanghai is doing new mass COVID testing due to a few positive cases. So fingers crossed, this does not lead to new shutdowns. That would be a major buzzkill with Tesla just hitting record deliveries in June and then having to shut down. I don't think it'll get back to that point, but nobody really knows. A week long jury trial is set to begin today in Florida. This is that story where a teenager died in a crash. He was speeding in a Tesla. His family had asked for Tesla to put in a speed limiting device because apparently their son was a habitual speeder. Then at a service appointment, somehow Tesla may have been deceived to take it off. And ultimately the family is suing Tesla saying that they were negligent removing that speed limiting device. This is the same story when Elon emailed the dad of this crash victim empathizing with him and talking about what it was like when he Elon lost his own son. That communication led to Tesla sending out a software update in 2018 for a speed limit feature that would let drivers set a maximum speed between 50 and 90. And this overhaul was in memory of Barrett Riley, one of the teens that died. Here's another EPS estimate for Tesla's Q2 financials on July 20th. Gary coming in at $1.40 earnings per share and the street sitting at $1.83. A GMC Hummer EV just sold on the secondary market for $324,500. This is supply and demand at its finest. GM has delivered 372 of these vehicles that cost around $112,000 since December. So there's not a lot out there, but apparently they have around 77,000 reservations 
reservations. So a decent amount of people want this vehicle and are now buying it on the secondary market. GM has to be sitting there wondering what's going on. They're selling the car for 110,000 and then their customers are turning around and selling it for 260, 275, 300 plus thousand dollars. So I wonder if they will do anything, change the price, or maybe put in a clause limiting sale of the vehicle for a year or so after purchase until they can produce more vehicles. Good news for Rivian, it reaffirmed its annual production target and revealed accelerated output in the second quarter. Rivian built 4,400 vehicles in the period up from 2,553 in quarter one. This keeps Rivian on track to produce 25,000 units this year across the three products, R1T, R1S, which those deliveries have not yet started. They have been pushed back until the fall and the EDV or the electric delivery van for Amazon. And Rivian actually delivered 4,467 vehicles in the second quarter. Great news here for Starlink fans as over 70,000 people have responded to the FCC, reaching out to protect its operations. Remember, this stemmed from Dish Network's proposal to use the 12 gigahertz radio spectrum for a 5G cellular network that would make Starlink unusable across the US, according to SpaceX. Starlink does rely on the 12 gigahertz spectrum to power high speed downloads, and Dish has been arguing on the opposite side that Starlink can work alongside a 12 gigahertz 5G cellular service without any major interference. And it definitely should be noted that Dish cited its own study on the matter. This definitely not a great sign from Fisker. However, I don't think we should really be that surprised. In an email sent to reservation holders, they said only 5,000 launch edition Fisker Ocean 1s will be made. They're inviting select groups of reservation holders to commit to securing their Fisker Ocean 1 by making a $5,000 non-refundable pre-order deposit. Toyota has officially crossed the 200,000 EV sold mark, so its phase out of the EV tax credit will begin soon. The phasing out of the EV tax credit actually starts two quarters after the automaker sells the 200,000th plug-in vehicle. The value of the tax credit is halved every six months until it hits zero. So Toyota's phase out will actually start on October 1st and be done one year from then in October 2023. So Toyota now joins Tesla and GM on the list of of automakers who have reached the cap and sadly Toyota used most of it on hybrids and this comes at a terrible time as it's just trying to ramp up the sales of its full BEV the BZ4X. And it looks like Nissan and Ford will be next as Nissan was at 166,000 cumulatively at the end of 2021 and Ford was at 157,000. Tesla has created a shareholder vote guide just walking you through the steps at different brokers so that you can actually vote your shares ahead of the upcoming annual meeting. I will include a link to this website below. That'll do it for today. Please take a second to like the video if you did. Hope you guys have a wonderful day and a huge thank you to all of my Patreon supporters. 